I am Vinny Todorich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there before long. You will be lean and mean, guaranteed. Wow, uh, it's the Friday show, and this is when I bring the big boys on. The heavy hitters, the ones that are way smarter than me, but as we learned a long time ago, it doesn't take much to find way smarter than me. But uh, these guys are luminaries, and they come in every Friday, and I appreciate the fact that they do. Uh, this guy has been on the show before. And uh, the last time I laid eyes on him um, was right towards the end of me living in Los Angeles. And I'll never forget, I drove to from Los Angeles to Houston to go to Low Carb Houston and be at his event. Uh, I'll explain more of that, but let's introduce this guy because you're going to love what we're going to talk about today. Nadir Ali, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great, Vinny. Uh, it's good to be on your show again. Uh, that's 2019 you were referring to. Yeah. And a lot has happened since then, and I hope we can make it a fun and educational session for your viewers. Um, we will, because uh, you always bring the goods. Um, you and I were talking off the air. Um, and, and by the way, I'm going to get into some uh, hot cholesterol talk in a minute. So get get ready. Um, <laughs> yes. Because I, I like a term that you used once before. You, not only do you promote cholesterol, but you promote quality cholesterol, which mm -hmm. I, I think makes a big difference. You know, people just throw cholesterol into some kind of, you know, basket of, ooh, the stuff is bad or LDLs are bad. We'll get into that. But I'll never forget going down um, to your event because we were already like we were leaving LA. A lot was happening all at once. I, I was finishing up my movie. Mm -hmm. we were, you know, that was coming out. Uh, we decided to move. Uh, I had an extra car that I couldn't take with me at first because we wouldn't have a place to keep it. So when you said, hey, would you come in? And I had just gotten back. I, I had done um, the, the, the thing in Austin uh, like a, a few weeks before that. Then I was in Europe because I climbed Mont Blanc, and then I came back, and I got in a car and drove to your event, did your event, which I thought was one of the best events of all of them, uh, the speakers you had and everyone that was there. I I'm not saying that to blow smoke. You had the right people. You, oh, you, thank you. absolutely. I was like, oh, wait, when's this guy going to talk? When's that guy going to talk? And you just want to be there watching all these guys talk. And you had like this little health fair that was going on. It wasn't so much that you guys were selling anything at that health fair as much as it was learn something. Would you agree with that? Oh, I couldn't agree more because the event was organized through University of Houston. Most of the people, all the faculty were voluntary. They were being paid no real uh, money to come in except an airline ticket and a place to stay. So there was no honor area associated with it. The, the conference price, uh, ticket price was so low. It was purely meant as an educational event to promote a non-prescriptive lifestyle. Non-prescriptive meaning you go to the doctor and you walk out with five prescriptions. We want to avoid that. We want to see whether people can improve their lives with what you are saying, lifestyle, changes in nutrition, exercise, fasting. And yeah, no, I really enjoyed that event. And we're going to have it again next year. Three years uh, of this pandemic has really messed us up. But for sure, we're going to organize it next year. And I want you to be there. Um, I'm already in. You, you, you almost don't have to. I would be upset if you didn't invite me. And I don't even have to walk on stage and do a talk. You could just invite me and say, hey, just come sit in the audience and watch everyone else. And I'll go, okay, I'm in. I'm in. Um, you, I mean, you had all the right people there. Um, uh, uh, Ivor Cummins was there. Um, oh, God, the other guy that talks about cholesterol, uh, Dave. Dave Feldman was Dave there. Dave Feldman, yes. I David got... Diamond uh, was there. Marianne DeMassey was there. Yes, so, that's where I met. I, that's where I met Marianne uh, for the first time. Was at your event. Yeah, great lady. 
yeah. uh, she she's done the fight for us and made my made my life easier she was uh, she was the first one who came out on abc australia that statins may really be not good with all the conflict of interest and all that and she paid a terrible price for it you know she yeah. lost her career and she got sued she lost her money and uh, but made the path easier for people like me because we've come after her uh, she had a good fight and it helps me say and do the things that i can do so hats off to her you know Marianne is one of these women, you know, I talk a lot about, um, you know, speaking of Australia, uh, Gary Fetke, who had this crazy fight there. Um, I, I talk about Tim Noakes. Mm -hmm. I think Marianne uh, gets overlooked too often in this fight of someone uh, just to give people in America an idea of who she was. Think of uh, one of our newscasters on national news here in the United States. And she just did a story, pretty much, from what I can tell. And you can butt in, dear, and tell me if I'm right about this. And <clears throat> her career was over with. She was she just did a story on statins. And this woman who was like a Katie Couric type, the next thing you know, she's fighting for her life. And her career is done. Did I say any of that wrong? No, you said it correct. But I'd like to add to that. You know, there was this dynamic very good looking, extremely intelligent PhD who does a story which is basically ahead of its time. I think it was like maybe three to five years ahead of its time. And that's what an investigative journalist is supposed to do. I mean, an investigative journalist is supposed to bring information and paradigms that are ahead of their time. And if we as a society cannot look at a scientific argument from multiple viewpoints and think that you want to stop this freedom of expression of scientific debate and use all the power of government and money to take away the life of somebody, there is something very wrong with society. Yeah, look, I mean, in America, we seem to be, you know, this is supposed to be the land of the free. Um, I know that you're not originally from this country. You're from India. Um, you you come to this country, you think, you know, America is going to be the land of the free. And we see stuff all the time, right, where people are now losing their careers and, and you know, they, they get deplatformed or um, uh, what's that term they're using where they, they just take their whole life away, right? They just go, you're out. Right. And I, I don't think it's right. They might not be saying what you want them to say. And it seems to happen here with politics more than anything else. But if you're not saying exactly the right thing at the right time in Australia, it seems to be worse. I mean, Gary Fetke was a doctor first do no harm. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was first doing no harm. He was saying, hey, I won't have to chop your limb off if I get you to eat a certain way. Mm hmm. And uh, people were succeeding and the government came in and went, hey, pal, you stop that and start chopping limbs off again. We're not paying you. I, I know this makes it sound like I'm, I'm kidding, but it was almost like they were going, we're paying you to do one thing. You seem to be doing a completely different thing. And we're not happy with that. Right. And I'll never forget Marianne. She was watching my movie that we showed at your event. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the movie, I had never met her before that. I knew her story. She was the first person to run up to me and say, hey, I I'm thank you for doing this. How were you able to get all of that into your movie? And of course, I knew she was from Australia. and I I'd known her story. And I said, it's because I'm an American. And we have a little something called freedom of speech. And if we start losing that here, boy, we're going to have a really bad problem. It's going to become like Australia or Canada or anywhere else where they're taking people's, you know, freedoms and liberties away. And this goes, folks, by the way, I'm not on the right or the left. I'm not political. I'm saying for everyone, we we need to be careful here because we're teetering on something that we might not want to deal with. Go ask Marianne. Go ask Gary Fetke. Go ask Tim Noakes. Go ask a lot of people. Right. They're paying yeah. the price. Yeah. What say you? 
I, I couldn't agree more. You know, every time I'm reminded of Billy Joel, Billy Joel is this great singer who had come up with this song called Shades of Grey. That shades of grey is the colors that he sees and black and white was easy for him. And to elaborate that further, he says that the only person he's afraid of is the man who has no doubt. And in many things that I say, I do have doubt whether I'm right or wrong. And I qualify that and I say the reasons for my, for my argument. And that's the very basis of scientific debate, that there is a rigorous discussion about what the real science is, because there could be differing opinions about interpretation of data. And uh, on that, uh, we should not prevent freedom of speech and nobody should be ostracized for that. Right. But, you know, we seem to fall into these camps now. Um, you know, earlier today, I do consults every day with folks. Uh, people can go to vinnytauteries.com and sign up for a consult. And I'll talk to them for either 30 minutes or an hour or whatever they sign up for. Um, and it was this woman, she goes, you know, I started doing low carb. I started doing, you know, your version in SNG. She downloaded the PDF and she, she you know, all, all the markers of metabolic syndrome, she told me within months had gone. I had her and her husband on the phone. And uh, within months, Monica tells me, uh, Monica and Chris, I can even look at their name. I'm not going to say their last name. Um, she's like, everything went down, right? All the numbers, went, you know, you know, my triglycerides went into a normal range. My uh, my uh, sugar, my blood sugar went to a normal range. Everything, my A one Cs had dropped. I wasn't, you know, diabetic anymore. And on and on and on. And she said the one thing I didn't expect was that my cholesterol dropped. Now, as you know, some people's cholesterol goes up. You know, you could be a hyper, um, uh, you know, um, uh, lean mass hyper hyper responder. Mm -hmm. Responder, and um, your she goes, mine went down from two something something down to one sixty five overall. And I went, ah, that's that's highly unusual, but not not completely unusual. And um, she goes, but my doctor still wants me on a statin. <laughs> And I said, is this a cardiologist? And she said, no. And I said, okay, what I'm getting ready to tell you is not medical advice. Mm -hmm. It's friendly advice. You need to find a different doctor. I said, uh, do you have any blockage? She goes, I don't know. I said, do you have any cardiac disease in any way, shape, or form? She goes, I don't know. I said, have, have you done a CAC? No, I haven't done anything. She's just going off of my cholesterol. And I said, again, you need to find another doctor. I said, did they do a particle test? No. What, what was your, you know, um, uh, I, I went into, um, you know, April B and April C. I said, what? She goes, I, I don't even know that. I've never heard those words before ever. Mm -hmm. I said, so wait, your doctor have, have you on a, a statin, yet your doctor knows nothing about what's mm -hmm. going on with your cholesterol. Sure. Go on. Now, I, I want to clarify a few things. First is that from what you told me that that lady is primary prevention. She's not had any established heart disease. And for primary prevention, you don't need a CAC scan. Primary prevention is somebody who's not had a heart attack, who's not had a stent, who's not had bypass surgery. Because CAC scans were not available when the primary prevention trials were done. So that's number one factor. So in a woman for primary prevention, there is absolutely no benefit of statins. In a woman for secondary prevention, which means somebody who's already had a stent or bypass surgery or a heart attack, the degree of benefit is small if it is there for reduction of myocardial infarctions, that is repeat heart attacks, but not for improvement in mortality. And this data comes with a lot of conflict of interest that we can discuss about clinical trials, uh, because I have a talk that is very popular on the internet, which is called, Do Statins Prevent or Cause Heart Disease? So that, that's, that's a, I would say that title again, Do Statins Prevent or Cause Heart Disease? 
So in this lady, the potential for for cognitive impairment, memory issues, myopathy, uh, reduction in her libido, um, there is a potential uh, for uh, many uh, statin-associated side effects like worsening insulin resistance and maybe even progression to frank diabetes is there. And I don't know her age, but perhaps she's going to take this medicine for 30 to 40 years. So a physician prescribing that drug should have an informed consent. I think they should discuss the degree of benefit, which is small. They should discuss the conflict of interest because these trials are run by pharmaceutical industry. They should discuss the potential side effects and the duration of therapy and empower the patient to make a decision along with that physician. To just blanketly give this drug and say it's good for you is not in keeping with the medical society guidelines. So that's that's something that you know I, I want to put out there uh, for people to understand. And, and we can discuss that further with our different scenarios. But your, your person is a good example of that. Now, I want to also add one more thing. And that one more thing is that you mentioned that this lady went on a low-carb diet. So let's say you take 100 individuals and you put them on a low-carb diet. And let's say all of them are low-carb predominantly with animal-sourced protein, animal-sourced protein and animal-sourced fat. Okay. Invariably the majority of them will have the improvement that you talked about, not everybody. And that improvement is improvement in diabetes, improvement in lipoprotein quality or cholesterol quality, as I would like to call it, uh, reduction in, in inflammation markers, weight loss, drop in blood pressure, all these good things happen to them. But in a large majority, the cholesterol, the total cholesterol and the LDL will go up. And I think that would be between 75 to 90% of these people. Okay. But in 10% of people, the total cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol will either remain the same or maybe even go down a little bit. And I used to be perplexed as to why that is happening. And I think the reason that happens is because they have a genetic anomaly in their LDL receptor or in their PCSK9. So, you know, I've been accused of being a nerd. So please- Yeah, un un that. nerd that. Pretend I'm in second grade and explain what you just said. Yeah, so there are receptors in our liver that suck up the LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol. I call it the other good cholesterol. So these receptors in the liver, they suck up the LDL cholesterol from the circulation. So there are certain people who have a genetic abnormality in having too many of these LDL receptors. And we have too many of these LDL receptors. Even if you go on a low carb diet, your LDL is going to remain the same or go down a little bit. It's not going to go up. Okay. In a routine situation where people have normal LDL receptor expression, with a low carb diet, the receptors are going to go down because you're eating a lot of cholesterol. And when you eat a lot of cholesterol, the liver is taking cholesterol from food and it's a lazy organ. It does not want to make cholesterol because it's very expensive. Right. Imagine you have a factory and you need to employ 30 different stations to make your end product, which is cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So you're going through 30 different assembly points to make cholesterol, and that becomes to be very energy expensive. So the liver says, I'm getting all this free cholesterol because this person is eating. Let me shut down my cholesterol production because I have too much cholesterol. And I don't need any cholesterol from the bloodstream. So it takes away the receptor that picks up the cholesterol from the bloodstream and so your LDL levels go higher in people on an animal-sourced food diet. Okay. But since this person has a genetic variation, I'm not going to call it an abnormality, a genetic variation 
in which they overproduce that receptor that picks up LDL from circulation, their LDL is not going to go up. It's going to remain low. And one of the variations of that is what is called PCSK9. It's worthwhile unpacking that also a little bit because one of the new drugs that's very expensive is a PCSK9 inhibitor, like Repatha and Praloent. Mm -hmm. These are about $5,000 a year. They, they started mm -hmm. out at about $25,000 a year. Unbelievable. But they could not be sold. People were not simply buying them because you had to inject them about twice a month into your into yourself. And they are agents that go and attack a protein in the liver. So the liver is making a protein called PCSK9. It has many roles. And one of the things that PCSK9 does is that it goes and binds to the receptor, the LDL receptor that is sucking up cholesterol from the bloodstream and destroys it. It takes it inside the liver and destroys it. So PCSK9 inhibitor goes and binds to PCSK9, prevents the destruction of the LDL receptors. So the liver is primed to pick up the LDL from the circulation and drop it to very low values. So these individuals, these 10% of individuals who are not dropping or who are not increasing their cholesterol on a low carb diet have a genetic variation in which they are not making that PCSK9. It's almost like they're taking that drug on a lifelong basis. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it was clear if I unpacked it well or no, but if you think I didn't, then we should elaborate it further, but it may be of interest to a lot well, of you. Let me, ask, let me ask questions around it. Sure. Uh, I have a, a friend uh, and I've had a few other people on the phone calls. So I have someone close to me and uh, several of my phone callers mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> who decided to go carnivore. You know, mm -hmm. they, they were just doing meat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the LDL just went up in a crazy way. Correct. Um, and, um, you know, a couple of these people are worried about it. My my buddy talked to Cyrus about it. He spoke, I think, to uh, Philip Avedi about it. He spoke to a bunch of people about it. Um, and uh, they calmed him down in several ways because every other marker that this guy has seen has he's done better on, right? He's, um, you know, everything else looks great. And he was just worried about his LDL going up, you know, just precipitously. I mean, is there any problem there? And I'm I'm talking around something without trying to give anyone's information away. Should people worry about that? Or should they be on this drug to combat that? How does that work? So the last thing I want to uh, tell people to do on a carnivorous diet to, is to go on a drug because I want them to have lifestyle changes. Right. I, I'm very non-prescriptive. I was born a cynic and a skeptic, and I am cynical about the pharmaceutical industry and its conflict of interest and how they try to push their agenda. And maybe <laughs> I take that to a fault. Uh, but I hear you. So let's talk about a carnivorous diet. Now, carnivorous diet is a good way to live. I think right. humans were designed to eat meat. Without eating meat, our brains would not be the size that they are. And we would not, we would not have evolved the way we have. Because if you look at the structure of our gut, we are predominantly designed to eat high quality food that we don't want, that we don't need to process. We don't have a lot of processing capability. We have a lot of capability to absorb high quality food and that's animal food. But there are places in which I differ from my colleagues in the sense that there is a potential for what is called lipotoxicity on a low carb, carnivorous diet. So let me unpack that. What is lipotoxicity? Lipotoxicity is fat toxicity. So it doesn't happen in everyone. Majority of people going on a carnivorous diet do fine because what happens is that their good cholesterol, which is called HDL goes up. The triglycerides, which is fat and blood goes down. And like you mentioned, their inflammation markers go down, their blood sugar regulation gets better. 
they lose weight, their blood pressure improves, they are feeling good. What happens is that the other good cholesterol or the so-called bad cholesterol, LDL goes up. And in my mind, that is not a bad thing because you are viewing it from a completely different standpoint. You're not viewing it on a standard American diet in a standard American in whom the LDL is high, along with high amount of triglycerides, which is fat and blood, low levels of HDL, which is the good cholesterol, along with insulin resistance and inflammation. That's a completely different paradigm than a person who is on a carnivorous diet who's improving from these as we elaborated. But let's pause for a minute because I always want to individualize my diet for my people. One prescription doesn't fit all. So let's say you take somebody who is heavy, let's say BMI 30 to 35. Let's say they have very high insulin, they're insulin resistant. Let's say they're teetering on their blood sugars, hemoglobin A1C in the pre-diabetic range, about 5.7 to 6.3. Okay. Now, these people have overstuffed fat cells. Their fat cells are already full. Their fat cells are unhealthy. The fat cells are inflamed. A carnivorous diet is usually accompanied by large amounts of fat because very little portions of animal food is actually lean. Uh, you got to go for filet mignon, certain cuts of meat that are lean, which are, by the way, very expensive. And most people are used to even adding fat like butter to their steaks and stuff like that because we give them the impression that you can overload on fat and it's not a problem. Okay. But it's a problem in these individuals because their, their fat cells are already full. And when you give these people fat, the fat gets taken by the bloodstream from the intestines. So in other words, Fat behaves very differently than protein and carbs. When you eat protein and carbs, the protein and carbs first go to the liver to be processed. On the other hand, the fat through the lymphatic system is dumped directly into the bloodstream with one goal. Let's pack the fat into the fat cells and get it out of the bloodstream. In these individuals, their fat cells are already full and it doesn't get out of the bloodstream, it remains in the bloodstream, and it increases the risks of them getting heart disease. So there is a potential for lipotoxicity in people who go on a carnivorous diet if they start out with unhealthy fat cells and insulin resistance. And that's the reason why I want to individualize these programs. These people are perhaps better off starting with a low carb, low fat, lean protein diet, which by design will have to be reduced in calories. It would be really, I'm describing like what is called a protein sparing modified fast and improve their exercise and first empty their fat cells with that technique for the first three to six, three to, well, maybe one to six months, depending on how abnormal they start out with and then transition to a diet that is more liberal in fat intake. Right. So that's going to be the, uh, my talk, and I'm going to elaborate that with science and slides and other things at Low Carb Denver in February, March of next year. That's going to be run by Jeff Gerber. And if you're not going to be there, you should book your tickets there. Yeah, um, you know, I've never been to Low Carb uh, Denver Um I was invited once to, I think, talk, but I couldn't at the time. I was doing something else at the time, and I think Jeff just went, "Oh, okay, well, we we just won't have any back." Or you know, <laughs> I don't know how that works, but I love Jeff, and he's been on the show. And um, you know, I'm going to do some skiing out in Colorado this year, so maybe I can make it happen around February and just pop in and see you guys. If nothing else, grab a dinner with you and say hi. Um, uh We'd love that, and and we should get you on stage because if you have Vinny at a conference and we don't get him on stage, that would be an injustice to the people who have. I, 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 okay, enough. We don't have to go there. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it, people need to see more of this mug on a stage. All I do is get up there and yell like Gran Torino. You know, get off my lawn! All you guys are wrong. Um, you know, you know what you said, and I I couldn't agree more. Right? Everybody wants the magic bullet as to how to make it happen, and they'll say, "Just tell me." what to do right now. It's like, well, what you're doing right now might not be what you're doing a few months from now. And you said three to six months, and, and I probably couldn't agree more. I find the problem is people want everything so instantaneous. How do you guys, I know that you work with people for free, basically to get them healthy. How do you get people to, to stick to this for six months? What, what magic do you have? <laughs> to get these people to, to hang in there. What, what type of support group do you have? Um, well, I have a number of uh, colleagues who work with me and we have become extremely good at giving people a lot of tricks and techniques on how to change their habits, how to improve their diet. And it starts with a whole array of things and I can get into some of them if you would like. Sure, sure. So let's, uh, have you heard about the dopamine spike? Yeah, yeah, I have, but I don't know. Go ahead and explain it. So let's say you take a rat and you give the rat a sugary reward for the first time. The dopamine goes way up. Right. Like it goes up like crazy. Now, if you then train the rat and say, okay, there is a light that's going to come in your cage. And when the light comes, you press this lever. And when you press the lever 10 times, then a sugar solution is going to drop into your cage and then you can have the sugar. So here the rat is learning the act that the light is associated with pressing the lever and then finally getting the reward. Right. Now, when would you predict the dopamine gets released in this situation? Now, because the rat has learned this memory, this learning, this behavior, that these sequence of events are going to give me pleasure. Okay, I would say that um, as soon as it sees the light, the dopamine goes up. Absolutely. Or it sees the, the sugar in the cage. Absolutely. So the dopamine goes up with the anticipation of the reward. And so the dopamine rises. And then it comes down. Now let's talk about once it has learned this, it actually goes and consumes the sugar and gets what we call as the gratification. Do you think that gives rise to another dopamine surge? No, I'm going to say no. And that's absolutely right. So our brain is programmed to get pleasure from the anticipation of a reward rather than the reward itself. And so I want people to create a dissociation between anticipation and reward, and then learn one other aspect. And I'm giving you all kinds of information based on experiments that have been done from 1950s to 1970s or even earlier, mm -hmm. because there was a, a Dutch biologist by the name of Nico Tinbergen. And Nico did some very uh, interesting things and he got a Nobel Prize for it. He was studying what is called herring gulls. Say that again. I didn't. I, he, he was studying. There is, there is a there is a bird in in Netherlands, the herring gull, gulls. The herring gulls. Right. Okay. So the herring gulls have a a red spot on their beak, and the chicks go and peck on that beak. And when they peck on the beak, the mother gives them food. So what Nico did was that he created a larger red spot on a beak, an artificial beak. And he took it and presented it to the cheek, uh, to the chicks. And to his surprise, they preferred to peck on that larger spot than to peck on their mother's beak, even though they were getting no food. And then he made the spot a little bigger and brighter. And he found that the rate of pecking got amplified and exaggerated, even though they were getting no food. Interesting. So what I'm describing with these two is what is called a super normal stimulus. Our biology is programmed to behave in a certain way in which when we see food, let's say 
caramelized sugar, pressed leches, any kind of fruit, any kind of uh, sugary food that you want to imagine, you're not getting a regular stimulus for eating that food. You're getting a super normal stimulus. And it's playing on our biology to consume it a lot more than we would have done in the primitive times. Our evolution has not kept pace with technological improvement, agriculture, the way we cook food, and food engineering that is manipulating our food. So the first thing we uh, tried to educate our uh, individuals who come to us is to talk about how they are being manipulated through super normal stimuli in their environment to consume more food and preferentially consume things that are priced in nature, i.e., you know, sugar, honey, things of that sort. Yeah. So there is a cognitive learning phase. The second thing I want to ask you is that if I were to tell you to change a habit, rely on willpower or relying on changing in your environment, what would you do? I would want to change the environment. Exactly. And so it is so important for people to understand, like, for example, I'll give you an example of BJ Fogg. BJ Fogg is somebody who works on habits. He calls it tiny habits. And apparently he found himself being addicted to popcorn. Mm hmm so he said, you know, popcorn is not good for me. So he took the popcorn, put it on the top shelf of his uh, garage where he would have to get a ladder to climb in, take the popcorn out, take it and have it. Right. So he's creating a resistance, a difficulty in getting to a bad habit. Right. And, and that's what uh, people should learn how to do. They need to remove all the junk from their food. So I gave you a couple of examples. Uh, there are many, many more techniques that are my associates know how to help patients with. And uh, we find, I mean, I won't say that everybody who comes into our office is successful, but we, unlike other practices, focus a lot on um, non-prescriptive lifestyle medicine to improve the same diseases that my colleagues work on. Yeah. And look, I couldn't agree with what you're saying more because yeah, the, I, I have tons of examples that I use when I when I coach people on the phone. Oh, I often tell a story about a buddy of mine from the 1980s um, who tried cocaine one night and just became an addict. You know, mm -hmm. and, and this is back in the days, Nadir, when they said, oh, cocaine is non addictive. You know, it doesn't hurt anything and holding. Well, this guy was spending money he didn't have to, to buy Coke. And um, when he he got into a program, a 12 step program, and he, you know, he learned to, you know, fix himself. And we were having a conversation once and I said, you know, I've never done Coke. What what was so great about coke and he goes you know the first time it was wonderful and he said the rest of the time i was just chasing that high and he goes as a matter of fact it was you know i was more excited about meeting the guy out at the the gas station who you know i was going to exchange my money for the coke and the whole thing and then planning oh tonight when i get home from work i'm going to get this chick over and we're going to do some coke and we're going to have sex and all this stuff he goes, the planning of the event was the high. Right. It wasn't, he goes, it was such a letdown whenever we were actually doing the Coke and anything else we were doing, the planning, he goes, my heart would be pumping when I would go meet the guy to go get the thing and this and that. And that's why when you said, what, what do you think is more important, getting the sugar cube or pressing the thing 10, and it's like, well, it's pressing the thing 10 times because I knew a real life version of that. Um, I also have a couple of friends who uh, ended up in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, 12 step programs. And they'll tell you the first thing they had to do was change their environment, change their friends. 
you know, most of their friends were at bars, oddly enough. <laughs> and they all supported each other in that endeavor. The first thing you have to do when you go to AA is change, you know, that you got to get rid of those friends. Now you have a bunch of new friends who only know you by your first name. And, <laughs> you know, you, you can't go to the bar anymore or wherever that was. Um, you mentioned popcorn. You know, I never eat popcorn. Mm -hmm. um, except if I was at a movie, right? When you go right. to the movie, associate with movies. You, you, I associate and you walk in, I'm not thinking of popcorn. When I walk in, I'm thinking, hey, Tom Cruise is going to be flying a plane really fast. <laughs> and I haven't been to a movie house in years. You know, I watch everything on a big screen right here in my office. And but I wanted to go see Top Gun Maverick on the big screen because everyone oh, it's special. You got to see it. You walk in, man. And I mean, the most Pavlovian thing, mm -hmm. you know, I had to walk past that smell to get into the theater. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it. And I'm a guy I, I live in dietary ketosis, right? Mm. And that thing was like, oh, man, just this once. I mean, I'm watching Top Gun Maverick. And I was walking in that direction. And then I, I thought about it for a second. I said, you know what? Whenever I eat carbs, all of my inflammation comes back. I'm going to have instant inflammation. By the time I get out of this seat to leave this movie house, I'm going to be crippled. And that made me turn around and just walk right into the movie house. But it's those type of things where you have to have enough resolve to where you go, okay, the juice is not worth the squeeze on this one. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to work. I want to work on creating a new paradigm here, Vinny. And I don't know if I'm going to be successful or no. Let's try. Why not? <laughs> yeah, let's try. So we, you know, we, we are smart individuals. We are humans. We have a thinking brain. We have cognitive capacity. We have agency. We know neurobiology. We know neurochemistry. We now know that the anticipation, the sight, the smell of something that you desire, whether it's popcorn or tres leches, is giving you all that dopamine spike. Right. So why can't we cognitively dissociate the fact that, hey, we are going, going, we are getting something that is pleasurable, but the consumption of that is going to give us no pleasure. Let me get all the pleasure here, but let me know, understand that I'm really not going to get pleasure by consuming it. I'm going to get the dopamine spike anyway. Yeah. You see what I mean? Well, and I wonder whether people can work on cognitive therapy to see something, recognize it for what it is, and yet not consume it and be happy with it, not feel like that they are disappointed. Because when you don't get a reward that you're looking for, you get disappointed. But with cognitive therapy, with brain paradigm change, right, you can change that aspect. You're going to get the pleasure. And when you don't consume something, you're not going to be disappointed because now you understand the neurobiochemistry. And I, and I want to see whether a strategy like that can be successful. I, I think it can, because, look, you know, we live in a world, uh, you know, you mentioned the Billy Joel song a, a while ago. And, you know, we live in a world where when I hear old songs, it could be a song from when I was 15 years old. You will think about the girlfriend you had back then. And you have these wonderful thoughts about this person who broke your heart eventually, right? And you can almost smell her perfume and you can you, you remember moments about it. And when you listen to that song, you have a memory of that person. It's not like, well, I guess now sometimes people do go on the internet and find old boyfriends and old girlfriends, but you have that moment and you go, oh my God, she was such a nice girl. I wonder what she's doing today. I wonder if she had a husband and kids and the whole thing. Right. We we have these things. Marcel Proust talks about that. Sometimes you'll smell a perfume and you'll get rocketed back 40 years, 50 years, and you'll be in a moment that doesn't exist anymore. Right. So we do do that all the time and not, we, you know, we don't have a payoff. Right. It's just you have a thought of that person from a smell or a song, something, you know, we use one of the senses. Sometimes there's more than one sense. Maybe it's smell and hearing, or maybe you'll see someone or you'll see a photo that will remind you of that person. And all, all of a sudden you can watch 40 or 50 years right away. Just wash it away 
and you're back in that moment. But we, we never have to capitalize on that. We don't have to call that person up and go, hey, can we have sex one more time? We don't have to do anything with it. We can just let it be, right? Absolutely. I, I do the same thing with food all the time. Um, and, you know, th the only time I really kind of give into it is when I'm somewhere. You know, I talk about putting life into living. If mm -hmm. I go to Louisiana, I always have fried catfish because I only go to Louisiana like twice a I'm year. A while, yeah. And so, yeah, it's got seed oils in it. It's full of carbs. It makes me feel like crap. But lately, when I've been going home, I haven't been having the fried catfish anymore because I go, you know, I really love the way it tastes, but man, I really do feel crappy the next day mm -hmm. or later on that day. Um, about the only thing I have left is when I go to Italy, I have gelato. And I might only go to Italy once every second year, right? <laughs> My gelato eating is down <clears> to <throat> that. But I think for me, it it takes a lot of resolve. And I, as you know, I'm that I'm that guy. I'm disciplined, right? I'm I, I work mm -hmm. out every day, and I'll sit down and and write a movie and do a movie and do all this stuff. I'm not quite sure everyone is that disciplined as you would be and as I would be. How do we get the regular person to do that? I don't think it's a discipline per se, Vinny, but before I talk about uh, your question, I want to say that I wish that you would consider the cognitive learning capacity that looking and thinking and smelling and considering eating that catfish or the gelato is giving you a pleasure spike. Enjoy that. Just, just dissociate from the fact that eating it is not going to help you. Right. And the eating is not going to help you because it's going to give you no dopamine spike and no pleasure. So I, I want people to have that disconnect. And I don't know if people can learn it, but I don't think that I have more, more willpower than others. I think I have a better ability to change my environment. Uh, and I change my environment by the food I keep in my uh pantry or my refrigerator, the food that I keep in my office. I also don't rely on willpower at times when my willpower is the weakest, which is towards late night, towards the evening. So I don't want to approach evening on in a hungry state. I would rather eat food earlier in the evening, give myself better sleep quality and not come into the evening with low uh, with hunger pangs and then go and grab anything that is available in front of me. Um, I employ the technique of a streak. Um, and I think uh, I, I one of my heroes is James Clear. Do you, do you know anything about James Clear? I do not, but go on, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. So James Clear is this guy who's written this book called The Atomic Habits. And he's got several nice uh, little snippets on YouTube. And he talks about this snippet about somebody going to Jerry Seinfeld, who was a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, you know, I'm, I'm an upcoming uh, comedian and Mr. Seinfeld, you are so successful. I want you to give me a trick that will help me become better and someday become like you. So Jerry Seinfeld apparently told him is that what I want you to do is to write a joke every day. So write, if, whether it's good or bad, just, just write a joke every day. And very soon you will have a streak of writing jokes for three days in a row. And see how long you can continue the streak without breaking it. So once you start a streak, you get into the habit of keeping up with that work. So I can tell you, like I started writing to work about two years and 10 months ago about a month before the pandemic. And in this last two years and 10 months, I have never come to work in a car. Really? Because I don't want to break my streak. I would go to all lengths not to break my streak, like ride in the middle of the night, ride with lights. And I mean, I, I do all the safety measures. Right. So I want to de-emphasize willpower. I want to emphasize cognitive input, understand why you're doing something, changing of your environment, 
coming up with streaks, recognizing one other aspect of your dopamine spike, which might be worthwhile talking about now, because, I mean, again, I'm going to go back and talk about B.F. Skinner. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, Dr. Skinner, he was a psychologist and he did pigeon experiments. But he didn't really understand why that was happening. And in 2003, a group of researchers figured out the neurobiology of that. So if we take the same scenario of the mouse, seeing the light, pumping the lever 10 times, mm -hmm. getting the sugary reward. If that happened 100% of the time, the dopamine, dopamine would go up with the anticipation, come down, the reward would create no further augmentation. Right. The reward would actually not be associated with a dopamine spike at all. And into this neurobiology of 100% reward, they added one word. And that word was maybe. And maybe meaning that you, you see the light, you press the lever, but you get the reward only 50% of the time. You don't get the reward all the time. What do you think happened to the dopamine spike? Was it the same or was it higher? I'm going to guess it went lower. So it went about two to three fold higher. Higher? Okay, I, wh why did I get that so wrong? Usually I'm good at the psychological stuff. So at 50% on random misses, Correct. the dopamine went higher? Correct. Was it anticipation? So, you know, this is what life is all about because you think that, hey, I'm good at I'm good at what I do, but sometimes I'm a screw up. But maybe I'm feeling lucky today, and maybe I'll do things right and get the reward. Right. So the fact that you don't get the reward gives you a higher anticipation. If you know for sure that an event is going to happen, you don't get the same dopamine spike. Whereas if there is intermittent variable reward the dopamine spike is much higher. Dr. Skinner showed that in his pigeon experiments, but he didn't understand the neurobiology. The neurobiology of this was defined very nicely by these experimenters, and it has been used by Las Vegas casino neurobiologists to make us gamble because you pull the slot machine mm -hmm. and the variable reward keeps you attracted to that machine. And that has been hijacked by the food industry to give you intermittent variable reward in several different foods that you're eating so that you continue to eat. They change the hotness index of pistachio nuts. They change the hotness index of uh, Dorito chips so that you can be satisfied with eating one chip that you have to finish the bag. Right. So we need to recognize how technology is hijacking our neural circuitry and making us consume more. And this knowledge is not really well disseminated. Well, well let me jump in there. Um, you know, I just had a woman on the show, um, a doctor, um, Dr. Stroman, Lisa Stroman, last week. She's coming out maybe right before this show on a Friday. And I had her on, and I want to get back to the Doritos. So don't let me forget about the Doritos. Sure. I had Lisa on, you know, Dr. Drew sent her to me, because I'm always fascinated with people and cell phones. The fact that mm -hmm. they have to have it in their hand. And um, as you can tell, I have a gym in my office, but I like to go out to the gym in town because <clears throat> otherwise I would be stuck in my office all day, um, like a rat in a cage. So I, I go to the gym and I see most people, mostly young people, but they have a phone with them. And in between every set, they're looking at something on the phone. They're addicted to that phone, that quick dopamine hit. Until the other day, I watched a kid and I'll demonstrate it for you by using my phone, which is right here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the car, you know, most equipment have the carabiner. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the young man wanted to change Mm -hmm. a bar out on the cable row, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he grabbed the bar with one hand mm -hmm. and he had his phone in the other hand like this. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get the carabiner. the carabiner off without putting his phone down. Mm 
Mm -hmm. he, he was doing this. And, and so I got very interested and I, I watched and a, a whole minute passed. And I, a minute means a lot to me because mm -hmm. I wait about one minute before I do my next set. But I said, you know what? This is well worth it. Another minute, you know, maybe 30, 40 more seconds passed. And he's trying to still do something. Yeah, I have big hands and I can almost make it around the phone. This guy didn't have hands as big as mine, and he's trying to do it. Finally, he put the he sat and put the phone on his leg, on his lap. Mm -hmm. And I went, that's a very interesting choice. Mm -hmm. The phone still has to be attached to him. He has to, it has to be touching him while he does this. And then after he got the device changed out, mm -hmm. do you think he did a set? He grabbed his phone. He grabbed his phone and started looking at the phone again. Right. And I looked at that and I went, wow, we are more fucked than we can ever imagine. Absolutely. You know, it, it, the, the addiction, that's why when I, I mentioned this to my friend Drew Pensky, he goes, you got to get Lisa Stroman on your show because she's doing work in this area. You mentioned Doritos. Mm -hmm. I take it a step further. Mm -hmm. I, I read a book years ago. Um, it was before I moved here. I, I remember I was visiting Washington, D.C., and I was listening to the book on, on audio called mm -hmm. Salt, Sugar, Fat. And mm -hmm. they talk about how, the, you know, the, the industry makes these foods so, so addictive. Doritos is not worried about you eating the whole bag. Mm -hmm. Doritos has to make that addiction so strong that the next time you're in the store, mm -hmm. your cognitive thought goes back to, oh, wait. I need to go down that aisle and get those Doritos again. Correct. I, I got to get that lemon lime Dorito flavor. Oh, and look, they, they got the barbecue too. And they got the, the, the cool ranch and everything else that they might have. Mm -hmm. Right. They're addicting you to not just to eat the bag that day, but days later, when you go back to the store that you're going to go, I need to go get that again. Absolutely. That's where they're going. They're not worried about today's purchase. They're worried about Nadir getting off of his bike one day and falling into that habit. Absolutely. Now, we are being hijacked in many different ways, not just with the food, but just like you pointed out, with technology, with social media, with Facebook, with YouTube, with all these algorithms. And uh, there are many interesting people who are giving us ideas about this, but we simply biologically and in terms of our programming in the way our, in which our mind works, our brain has not kept up with the improvement in technology. We, evolutionarily, our brain, brain is still primed to live maybe uh, a thousand, 10,000 years uh, from now, before this time. Right. And so, uh, Fortunately, we have cognitive thought. Fortunately, we have agency. And we can change all of this. And your shows and similar shows are the reasons why we are doing better as a species than we would otherwise have. But, you know, I, I don't I don't really believe that because, you know, whenever I talk about, um, you know, we talk, you mentioned agency, right? And we talk about, oh, this show, but most people would look at me and, and you know, they, they call me Grand Torino online, you know, because I'm, I'm old and you know, I, I get called Boomer and I get called all this stuff. But, you know, AI is taking over and we don't even know it's taking it is seeping in so slowly and so deliberately. We're not even seeing. I'll give you prime examples. Um, when I drive my car now on the freeway, I love putting the cruise control on because in the good old days, Cruise control was you had to pay attention still because if you got too close to a car, you had to hit the brakes. Mm -hmm. Now cruise control, if you get too close to a car, the car brakes itself. Adaptive. Right? It, it adapts to. So that's one more thing that's taking my eyes away from the road. I don't, I don't look at my phone or anything, but boy, it can lull you into this false sense of security. What if that thing doesn't work one time? You'll just plow into a truck or, or something. Um, when I was a kid, Nadir, you're younger than me, but when I was a kid, I had maybe 30, 40 phone numbers in my head. Mm -hmm. If you told me to call Todd Robert, I knew his number. If you told me to call my buddy Moose, I knew his number. If you told me to call Benji's number, I knew his number. 
I knew everybody's number, right? Right. Ask me how many numbers I have in my head right now. There's one. It's my wife's number because that's the one we punch in at the grocery store to get the discount. <laughs> right. You say, oh, put in your, your, your number. That's the only because when I call my wife, I don't press her number in. I press Serena in and it goes to her. I don't know my daughter's number. Right. And when people ask me my number, I have to think about it. Absolutely. My own number. I have to go, I'll go uh, 925. Oh, no, that's my wife's number. You know, I go right to her number. I have to think about my number. Right. That's pretty scary, right? Absolutely. That's AI taking over, and we're letting it happen. And, and, and there are certain things that are going to help us. You know, what you talk about is memory and this there's been a lot of talk about that and i don't know if you know or no but there used to be memory competitions in which people could tell you the sequence of cards just by looking at it once and those things are not there anymore and there are people who talk about how important memory was we have externalized it and external externalization of memory into your cell phone into other devices has some benefits, but also has downsides. The benefits is that it frees up our time to do something more creative and better. Uh, the downside is that if we don't use that time and do something that is destructive, that's when it is bad. But you and see, after, the thing we're using, Nadir, I think, and I could be way wrong, is people are going, I have more time freed up. Where's my cell phone? Let me play a game. Right. Is that constructive? I mean, you're doing something constructive. You're saving lives. Right. Um, you're riding you're riding a bike. Um, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm just you know, I just I sell vitamins and food. And, you know, I, I don't play games. But are we really using that time as a people, as a society? Are we using that time wisely? That That's what I'm always wondering. What say you? Oh, I, I, I think we are not using that time wisely. And I am just at risk of going down the path of destructive behavior as anybody else. And even though I'm a physician and even though I know so much about nutrition and about healthcare in general, I follow some of my heroes in terms of proper use of technology. So I, I am, in some ways, a digital minimalist. I don't know if you know about Cal Newport. You should consider getting him on your talk show. I, I do not know him, but uh, maybe you can tell me who he is and introduce me to so, him. Cal Newport is a professor uh, out in Boston, and he's written a lot of books. Uh, one of the books, uh, the two of his books that I'd like to talk about is Deep Work and Digital Minimalism. So in digital minimalism, he talks about the cell phone as being like a slot machine in your pocket. Right. People take it out and view it 85 to 100 times a year. And social media, YouTube, the like button, the love button, and all that has captured our attention. We post something on social media, and we need to immediately go back and see, oh, how many people saw it? How many like buttons did I get? How many comments did I get? And that's very destructive to our time. And so being a digital minimalist is something that you need to practice. Like for example, I have removed all social media, YouTube from my phone. I actually have to get up, go to a room where there is a desktop, sign on, and get to do those things. And that creates a barrier. So I have changed my environment. Right. I've not changed my willpower. And I'm following the lead of people who are smarter than I am in areas that I'm not smart. I'm smart in lipoprotein profiles. I'm smart in nutrition and the intersection of nutrition with metabolic syndrome. But I follow the lead of these other people in areas in which I'm deficient. But you sell yourself very short, Vinny. I, I, I wish that you would understand the kind of positive impact you have had on society over several decades with your movies, with your talk shows, with what you do, with what you promote. And uh, 
the guests that you get on the shows, the time you spend in investigating what they are going to talk about and ask the right questions. Now, that takes talent. That takes time. That takes effort. Well, I, I feel like P.T. Barnum, and I just run the circus and I try to get the best acts in, in the house because, you know, that that's my deal. You know, like uh, Schindler at the end of Schindler's List, I, I could have done more. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm always waking up going, I could have done a lot more. And maybe I'm not, not using my time wisely in trying to do this for people. But I shall keep trying and uh, I, we'll make that the last word um, uh, that uh, I'm selling myself short and I will keep trying. Folks, I want to make you guys aware of where you can go because uh, Dr. Nadir Ali is doing stuff for free. Uh, the, the, you know, a lot of people are selling crap online. You can just go right to um, alicardiology.com and you can go there and get information. Um, you know, Nadir is, is literally doing the Lord's work, if you believe in God. <laughs> I'm an atheist. Um, so go there and check. Where else can they find you, dear? So the most useful information they can get about what I do is to go to the Eat Mostly Fats YouTube channel. Eat Mostly Fats YouTube channel. I have a number of my YouTubes out there. There are other YouTubes that are posted through Low Carb Denver. Uh, one of my YouTubes that really was my coming out party was the talk that I gave in 2019 at Low carb Denver that's been washed over uh, 1.3, 1.4 million times. And other talks are similarly very popular because I think that they give you good information. And there's a smaller YouTube channel called Nadir Ali MD uh, that also will have a lot of content. Um, I'm not looking to increase my practice. Uh, I used to do online concerts, but I would like to stop because they are very draining. They, they take a lot of my time. It, it takes a lot of effort. And sometimes I feel like I'm not giving them service because I'd like to explain all of that content in a YouTube that people can go and get many of these questions answered and then subsequently have a much shorter visit with me so that they have to pay less. Yeah. Um, look, I get it. I still do the consults. I love doing it, but it does take a lot of time. I, I walk the whole time I'm talking to people. I'm, I'm out there walking. So I get hours and hours of walks every day, five days a week. So folks, those are the places to go find the deer. Um, I was so enthralled with the conversation. I forgot to tell you guys about Villa Capelli. Villa Capelli Olive Oil is the longest running sponsor of the show. There is no seed oils of uh, in Villa Capelli. It's only olive oil. So you want to go check them out. You get 10% discount by putting in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y. Also at Villa Capelli, and this is important, if you spend more than $100 after the discount, so spend about $115. After the discount, you'll save um, on shipping because uh, you'll get free shipping. So there's two ways to save at Villa Capelli. Um, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, Go to VinnyTotteries.com, click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. We also have the super fan page. That's how I keep these wonderful doctors and luminaries coming on the show. Um, folks, if you're listening to this over on YouTube, I'm turning off YouTube right now, but you might want to go listen to the rest of the show on audio because I have a little something special for Dr. Ali. So uh, you guys go on over there. I'm turning off YouTube. Goodbye.